Happy Father's Day, everybody. <laughs> Hope you're feeling good. Hope you're having a good day so far. Uh, pray that, man, this afternoon you enjoy and celebrate your dads. Um, we are in a series right now entitled uh, Jesus Stories, where we're looking at the 37 different miracles that Jesus did throughout the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And uh, where we find ourselves this morning is in John chapter uh, 21. And before we read, before we pray, I just want to give you a little context for where we're at. In John chapter 21, it's the final chapter of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the final chapter of, of the book of John. And, uh, and here at this moment, Jesus has already conquered death, hell, and the grave. He's already risen from the grave, and at this point, the disciples are questioning uh, still things still, whether or not he's actually done this. And this is the third encounter that Jesus has with his disciples. So before we read this morning, let's just go ahead and pray, and let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. Lord, you are so incredibly good. Lord, you are, just as we talked about earlier, Lord, you are the best father. There was no one like you. There was no one beside you. And Lord, just as Jacob even prayed earlier, God, there are people in this room who are celebrating Father's Day for the first time without a dad. Lord, I pray that God today, that Lord, you would be their dad, that God, they would recognize that, just how much you love them, how much you care for them, and you bring them peace that surpasses all understanding, Jesus. Lord, this morning as we dive into your word, God, I pray that, Lord Jesus, that, Lord, we would, um, we would walk, God, in the love that, Lord, you were challenging us to walk in. That, Lord, we would know your love, your manifest presence in this place, oh God. That in that, Jesus, we would go and we'd take it and we would make disciples, God. So, Lord, would you... Speak through your words this morning, God. Lord, take your Logos word and make it rhema. Open our eyes to see you clearly, God, today. We're here for one reason only, and that is you, Father. That is you, Jesus. So we just say, speak today for your servants are listening. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. Who's ready this morning? Let's dive in. John chapter 21, verses 1 through 14. Let's read this together. After these things. So what's incredibly interesting about this phrase, after these things, is John is the most chronological uh, book in the Gospels. So we see this phrase, after these things, 15 different times. So it says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples, uh, two others of his disciples were together. So we have seven total disciples who are on this fishing trip. Let's keep reading. Verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. How many love fishing in this room? Any dads love fishing? Let's go. I'm going fishing, they said to him. We're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. So the first time Peter encounters Jesus is in Luke chapter 5. And in Luke chapter 5, Peter finds himself in the exact same position as a fisherman. That night he had caught nothing. And Jesus says, hey, cast your nets on the other side, just we see right here. So this is almost a mirroring of how Peter encountered Jesus for the first time. And he challenges him here in a second, just as he challenged him here in Luke chapter 5 when he told Peter to catch men. There could be a fisher of men, verse 4 now. But when the morning had, come, had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Now we can look in this phrase and say, okay, is there a spiritual reason why they did not know it was Jesus? No, it simply was just early in the morning, it was dark out, so they didn't know it was Jesus because they couldn't see him clearly. Verse five, then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast 
net, and so they cast it on the right side, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. So they weren't able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Now, what's, what's crazy is last time that Jesus told them to cast the net on the side, and they were trying to draw it in, they actually drew it into the boat, and it, it filled the boat so high that it, the boat began to sink. So perhaps here they're getting a little smarter, they're not going to pull it in, they know the, cast, the nets are full. Verse 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, this is funny because who's this referring to? That disciple whom Jesus loved. It's referring to John. Let me ask you this question. Who wrote the book of John? John. And so John is saying about himself, that disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, what's even crazier is in the previous chapter, this, he says this six different times, but in the previous chapter, he makes a comment. He says that uh, the other disciple outran Peter. In other words, John is really competitive because when he refers to this, it's actually John saying about himself that he's making a point that he outran Peter. I'm just showing you right now that he has a personality about himself. He's a little bit competitive. So, therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, talking about John, said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it and plunged it into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits. So what's crazy is 200 cubits is about 134 yards. So think about it. They're about one entire football field away from shore. One entire football field away from shore. So it says this, dragging the net with fish, verse 9, then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have caught. Take a moment. Think about this. Jesus is camping out with these disciples. Can you imagine sitting around a campfire with Jesus and Jesus makes fish and bread for you? This is the circumstance right here that we're reading about. Jesus is camping out with his disciples. He makes them fish and bread, best fish and chips probably that's ever been created, ever been made on the face of the planet. Like this is Jesus making this for them. Verse 11, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Now, this might seem extremely insignificant to us that the net wasn't broken, but John mentions that the net wasn't broken because of fishermen. There's no possible way that 153 large fish wouldn't break the net. So John mentions it, that this is Jesus. There's no way this doesn't happen. There's no way the net doesn't break except for Jesus doing something about it. So verse 12, Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them. And likewise, the fish. Just, just think, Jesus inviting them to a table, inviting them to the table and handing them food, handing them fish, handing them bread. Verse 14 this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So Jesus does this incredible miracle to these disciples. As fishermen, they went all night not catching a single fish. And then Jesus, just as he did in Luke chapter 5, he shows up on the scene and says, hey, cast the nets on the side. They pull in these 153 large fish. The nets don't break. Incredible miracle. And then he invites them to the table to sit down with him. And he feeds them. He cooks them a meal. You know, incredible conversations happen around a campfire, don't they? So Jesus feeds them. He has these conversations that we're about to read with Peter here in a moment around this campfire. And he asks Peter this question. He asked him, do you love me? Do you love me? Now, we think about love here in the English language, like our view of love is such different levels and degrees. Like at the same time, we say that we love, we love our dads. How many love your dad? Come on. At the same time we say we love our dads, we also say we love tacos. We love our wife. We love our spouse. But at the same time, we say we love steak. We love vacation. 
We love sex. We love all these different things. We love all this different stuff. There's different levels and degrees of love. Now, in the Bible, there's three different types of love that are described. There's eros love, which is a sexual type of love. Intimate love between you and your spouse. There is um, philia, which is a brotherly, friendly love. And there is agape, which is the highest level of love. The highest level of love. And so Jesus has this question with Peter. He says, do you agape love me? Do you love me with all that you have? Would you love me with all that you are? Or is this the highest level of love? Jesus is asking him, do you love me, Peter? And Peter responds with this phileo love. Yes, Lord, I love you with this brotherly love. Let's read this together. John 21, 15 through 17. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love? Do you agape love me? more than these. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, phileo, love, brotherly love. He said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I, phileo, love you, brotherly love. He said to him, tend my sheep. So he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you Phileo, love me. The third time, Jesus asked him, not agape love, but he asked him, do you phileo love me? And Peter, he was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. So I'll ask you two questions on this Father's Day. Two very simple questions. The first question I want to ask you is, do you agape love Jesus? Do you agape love Jesus? The second question I want to ask you is, will you feed his sheep? Will you feed his sheep? Now, when I've asked you this question, do you agape love Jesus, you might be saying, Adam, that's a really simple question, but it's not as simple as we make it out to be. Because Peter here, he's saying, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. You know I love you like a brotherly love. But Jesus is wanting all of who we are. What is the definition of Jesus' agape love? Look at this, John 14, 21. This is Jesus' definition. This is what he means. Jesus says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who agape loves me. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Simply, if you love Jesus, if you agape love Jesus, you will obey him. Church, if you really love him, you will obey him. What I'm talking about this morning is, is not a, man, Jesus is my homeboy. I'm not talking about that. Jesus is my friend. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about do you love him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength? Do you love him with everything you have, everything that you are? Have you really fully said, oh, Lord, I just want to be obedient because I love you so much? Do you really love the Lord. If you really love the Lord, what are you going to do? You're going to obey him. You know, I'm not talking about this morning, you know, we all sin. We all fall the short of the glory of God. We all walk in sin from time to time, but blatant sin holds us back from the Lord. If you're living in blatant sin, it's holding you back from the fullness of what God has for you. Think about it this way. My, if my wife and I were engaged, about to get married, if my wife said to me, you know, Adam, I'm gonna, I'm gonna love you, and I'm gonna cherish you, we're gonna grow old together, and I'm gonna be with you 90% of the time, but 10% of the time, I wanna be with my ex-boyfriend from high school. <laughs> Would I walk into that marriage? Absolutely not, no way. I don't care how beautiful she is. I'm not doing it. Why do we think it's okay if we are the bride of Christ, 
to blatantly live in sin if we really agape love him? Why do we think it's okay? Because it's not, if you love him, what does it say? You'll obey him. You obey him, you obey him, you love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Now watch this as we keep reading. And he who agape loves will be agape loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. I will manifest myself to him. I love that phrase. I love the phrase. I love them and I will manifest myself to them. I'm here saying this morning, Lord, if you want to manifest yourself to us, God, we are here. Lord, would you show us your glory? Would you show us your power? Anyone else just want to know the manifest presence of God? He who loves him with his agape love, he will show his presence. I want more of Jesus. I want more of him. I want to experience more of him. Here's the thing we thought that Jesus' love, God's love for us, was going to lead us to health, wealth, and happiness. <laughs> we thought that our love for God was going to lead us to success in life with the things that we want and we desire. But my friend, what happens is Jesus, what he does is he just simply shows himself to us. He shows himself to us. It has nothing to do, our, the, God's love for us has nothing to do with our health, wealth, and happiness. It doesn't. Because if you think about it, if the measure of Christ's love for us had to do with our health, wealth, and happiness, he hated the disciples. Peter, Peter was scrutinized. He, was, um, he lived a difficult life. He died a gruesome death upside down on a cross because he didn't want to die as his Savior died. Jesus' love has nothing to do with your comfortability. It has everything to do with do you know him, him showing himself to you. And let's just confirm this through Scripture. But I really pray this morning that you feel the weight of this today. And that you, if you haven't experience the love of Christ before, that today you experience the love of Christ like you've never experienced them before. John 3, 16 is a verse that always comes to mind when I think about the love of Christ. And many of you, you memorized this verse when you were a kid. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have what? Eternal life. And we say, yes, let's go. Then we'll have eternal life with Jesus. But what is eternal life? Here's Jesus' definition of eternal life. John 17, 3, this is eternal life that they know you. Say, know you. That they know you. The only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Period. That's eternal life, to know him, to know him forever, to know him with increasing knowledge and increasing admiration, increasing wonder and increasing joy. That's eternal life. Eternal life is God revealed his glory, satisfying the places and the longings within our hearts. When we've tried to fill it with Netflix and Facebook and social media, uh, boats and bigger car, nicer cars and bigger homes, we try to fill it with everything else other than him. But you were made by God, formed by God himself, and we are the only creatures on this planet who were made in his image. And our purpose in life is simple. Your purpose in life is simply just to know him. Just to know the height, the width, the breadth, the length of the love of God for you. He loves you so much that he gave his only son. And what it means is, man, eternal life is that we just simply know him. We're with him. Our purpose is simple to know him. And when we know him, we love him. When we know him, when we really know the Lord, we will love him. And without him, we can't really love. Look at 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And everyone who loves is born of God 
and loves God. Let us love one another from a place of loving Christ ourself. If we don't have agape love for God, we can't really love with that highest level of love, the purest level of love. The second question I want to ask you this morning is this. Number two, will you feed his sheep? It's very simple. Will you feed his sheep? So three times, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And he gives the command, well, then feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Because if you love Jesus, you will what? You obey his commands, and so therefore you will feed his sheep. But who are his sheep? Those who know his voice. John 10, 27 to 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. We're to go. We're to tell others about Jesus, aren't we? We're to tell others. Everywhere we go, we're we're supposed to have eyes to see as Jesus uh, sees and, and tell others about the one that we love, the one that we care about, the one who is so close, the one that we've given our life to, the one who we love with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. If we love him, we will tell others about him. But it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't just stop at making converts. It starts with discipleship. If we love him, we will disciple others. The Great Commission doesn't say, go, therefore, into all the world and make converts. No, what does it say? Go, therefore, in all the world and make what? Disciples. Go and make disciples. Yes, tell people about Jesus, but man, get in their life and make disciples. You know, by and large, we are a church who makes disciples. Here's the thing. I can't disciple all 800 people, 700 people here. I can't do it. We have to have other people, right, to disciple. And we have amazing small groups that started last week. If you haven't found a small group yet, man, get involved. I think some of them are even starting this next week and meeting for the first time. It's not too late to get involved. But it's a beautiful thing, man, when we get in small groups and we begin to iron sharpens iron and uh, make disciples and to pour into each other's lives and to get in each other, ask each other the hard questions so we can really grow in him. Another way to help make disciples is find a place to serve. When you find a place to serve, man, what what begins to happen is you just begin to meet someone new you may have never met. You build this relationship, and not only are you serving together and you're meeting others' needs through your gifts and your talents that you're giving God, but it allows you an opportunity just to, man, to do that iron sharpens iron, to get together, to talk about the Lord and be discipled. Discipleship is so incredibly important. Man, this past Monday night, I went to the, to the men's group um, that's meeting here, and they're breaking off into smaller groups, but there was over 80 men meeting. I mean, come on, Jesus. So good. And I just love to see people just having a desire to grow in the Lord, to grow in him and to know more about him and disciple one another and to get in each other's lives and to share about what God is doing in their life. And, man, that encourages one person because we all have a story to tell. And your story is significant. And as you're able to get in people's lives, man, you're able to tell the story and they're able to get something from it. They're able to grow and to move uh, towards the Lord. And let me, um, let me just be honest with you. You know, oftentimes we allow the, the busyness of life and the struggles of life to keep us back from getting in people's lives and to really truly disciple people. And, you know, this past year for me, it's been a whirlwind. It's been, um, it's been wild. It's been crazy. Serving as lead pastor for only a year, it's been a change, a shift in my family um, and just, uh, you know, trying to get a new rhythm of life and a new rhythm of things. And maybe for me, you're like, maybe you're like me and I'm trying to find this new rhythm of so that I can find space to really disciple people. Because me standing up here and preaching, that's not discipleship. It's getting in people's lives. What did Jesus have? He had really the, the two or three people that he was discipling closely. And so I, I just kind of, I'm just admitting to you this morning, I need a recalibration. Like, who am, who am I discipling? Well, I need to disciple the elders. I need to disciple the staff. And I can do a better job of that. And I'm just saying this morning, maybe you're like me and you can 
disciple others because maybe you've been busy, maybe the things in his life have been holding you back, maybe circumstances have happened, it's been difficult for you, maybe you need a recalibration like I do. One thing that really stuck out to me uh, this past week that really let me know that, man, I really need to look at my own life and refocus and recalibrate just what the Lord is, is doing. And um, I was having uh, uh, pizza with my son. I took him to a new pizza restaurant that opened off college. Amazing pizza. I mean, we love pizza together. Like the, the char on top of the pizza was really good. The quality of cheese was amazing. Like I'm a cheese pizza connoisseur. And I'm like, man, this is the best pizza I've had uh, in this area. And so we're enjoying this pizza. And I'm just kind of getting in his life. And I'm asking Caleb, he's 10 years old. I'm saying, so how you doing, buddy? What's going on in your life? And um, he says to me, just typical hard degree uh, answer. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. You know, just... People, a few words, and then I ask him, I say, so Caleb, um, how do you feel about this, this past year with, with you know, my, my job change and ministry change? And he just says to me, well, I wish you were the worship pastor again. I'm like, okay, that's, that's kind of hard to hear from you. I'm not telling you the story to feel bad for me. I'm not, I'm not at all. I'm just saying, like, hey, so everyone can get off with their job and being busy and all that kind of stuff. And I said, well, well, why? why? Why do you feel that way? And he goes, well, you spent a lot more time with me before. And I just said, oh, buddy, I'm going I'm to do better. Like, I'm going to try to spend more time with you. I'm going to try to get more into your life and do like we did before. And you have to understand um, as well that, hey, in life for all of us, it's um, explaining to them that, you know, we live on mission as a family. That we're living on mission as a family and bring them along in that mission as a family. And you were called with your family to live on mission. But also, I just said to him, man, I'm going to work hard at spending more quality time with you. Because you know my first ministry, it's not y'all. It's not this church. My first ministry is my family. Your first ministry is your family. And so maybe for you this morning, you're in the same spot I am as a dad. Maybe you've allowed your work and your ministry to come ahead of your family, ahead of your kids. And you just, like I do, you just need to recalibrate things a little bit, refocus. What is really important? Well, it's your kids. It's your spouse. It's your wife. But being the leader of your family, just as we prayed beautifully uh, during the worship set, that, man, your focus has to be, first off, your first ministry is your family. I want to end with this this morning. John 21, 18 through 19. Let's keep reading this. It says this, Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Verse 19. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Follow me. Peter, will you follow me? Here's the thing. It's never too late for you. No matter what circumstance you're in right now, No matter what you've done in your past, it's never too late to follow him. Will you follow him? Listen, Peter denied Christ three times. This is this passage we read is Peter's restoration back with God. You can never do anything too great to keep you back from the love of Christ. Like he's pursuing you with reckless abandon. He loves you with a perfect love. And what he wants from you is just for you to say, Lord, I want to follow you. Lord, and, 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 and so my question is, do you love him? Will you love him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength? Will you agape love him? My second question is, will you feed his sheep? But maybe you're in this room this morning, you're just saying, man, I've never made a choice to follow Christ before. I've never given my life to him. Maybe you're in this room this morning, you've already made that choice before, but you've kind of walked away. And you're just in a time right now where you're saying, man, I need to rededicate my life to Jesus. 
Would you do me a favor? Would you rise with me in this room? Just close your eyes just for a moment. I believe that the Holy Spirit right now is speaking.